Yep, got it. Thanks. <laughs> Let's try that again. At this time, I call to order the regular meeting of the Maricopa County Community College District Governing Board for September the 24th, 2019. To lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance is Sa... I practice this, so... <laughs> Sawiafa. <laughs> she says it much more elegantly than that. Tafisi, a student at Scottsdale Community College. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. We have one substitution tonight, Dr. William Guerrero for Dr. Greg Peterson. And now for our student life reports, we have students from Scottsdale Community College. Members of the board, Dr. Harper Marinick, members of CEC and guests. My name is Mina Buford and I serve as chair of the Council of Student Leaders under the Center of Civic and Global Engagement at Scottsdale Community College. I've had the opportunity to participate as chair of the Council of Student Leaders, also known in short as CSL. For one semester now, through the council, I've been exposed to a variety of ways that the community members and students alike can become and remain engaged in civic matters especially through CSL's Civic Engagement Committee. While in my position as chair, CSL and the Center for Civic and Global Engagement hosted an array of events to engage students in civil discourse. During this fall semester, the Council of Student Leaders will orchestrate a variety of events to keep our students engaged. For example, this past Tuesday on Constitution Day, CSL not only participated in the live stream with Maricopa County recorder Fontes, but we provided an engaging patriotic table with information about the United States Constitution. CSL held this event to inform students of its importance and how it cultivated the beautiful country we all live in today. Moving forward, my committee and I will partner with, Scott, with Scottsdale Coalition of Today and Tomorrow, better known as Scott, to help educate our peers on the importance of being civically engaged in our local community. One of CSL's goals is to make each student feel welcome at Scottsdale Community College. Aside from creating fun activities to engage our students on campus, the Council of Student Leaders takes pride in honoring the cultural significant days that fall within our school year. We plan to collaborate with our fellow clubs, Latino Student Association and the Indigenous Student Association at SCC to help recognize Hispanic Heritage Month and Native American Heritage Month, to name just a few. The Council of Student Leaders of Scottsdale Community College will take pride in tastefully supporting the cultural backgrounds of our student body. While CSL promotes engagement in local issues through the Civic Engagement Committee, we also focus on the international perspective through the efforts of the Global Awareness Committee. It is important to create an environment that helps students participate global integration in order to navigate this globalized world successfully. Our Global Awareness Committee, overseen by our Vice Chair, Sarah Drennan, is responsible in the process of planning our traditional International Education Week that will take place the third week of November. As well as collaborating on other SCC events such as Genocide Awareness Week and the End Thing, a day that celebrates the inclusivity of our SCC campus. CSL has participated in a few volunteering events as part of, as part of our mission for community service. Last fall, our council participated in packaging emergency food boxes at St. Mary's Food Bank this past spring. We lent our time and efforts to the Pueblo Grande Museum when the original event was canceled without notice to help sling mud to repair the ancient Hohokam platform mound. We took the initiative to spend the next couple of hours cleaning up the grounds of litter and debris that easily found its way on the property with it being located in downtown Phoenix. Volunteering our time and serving our community off campus has been some of the most memorable and fulfilling experiences we've had as student leaders. 
I am proud to announce that CSL is in the process of organizing our third annual Artichoke Pride Week, taking place from October 21st through the 23rd. Its planning will be overseen by our special events manager, Gabby Coons. This week will hold various events that promote our artichoke spirit, like the Arty Mile Walk, co-sponsored with our Fitness and Nutrition Club and Student Nurses Association. A friendly banner competition between Fields of Interest and Student Affairs Department, and of course, Arty Idol. Idol, excuse me. A campus favorite that includes an open mic, various performances, judges, and fun prizes. Oh, and it's Artie's birthday. We plan to bake him a cake with the help of our culinary arts department. Shh, don't tell him. <laughs> Scottsdale Community College is home to 26 vastly different clubs that range from the SCC and American Society of Interior Design to the Sonoran Desert Club. These clubs have allowed students to be engaged in events that cater to their specific field of study or personal passion, providing them opportunities to be exposed to an environment that will help them grow professionally. We couldn't be more proud of the activities that our clubs offer to our students' body to enrich their educational experience, like the SCC Robotics Club participation in the Sister STEM event, which they mentored high school female students and our DECA and Hospitality and, tu and Tourism Clubs, hosting guest speakers from our respective industries to speak about their experiences and answer questions about getting a job in their field of interest. I cannot go on with this report, without introducing to you this amazing diverse group of leaders that I am so fortunate to be a part of. Our ages range from 18 to 37 years old. We are proud to have a mother of three, a beauty pageant winner, a former auxiliary member of the United States Air Force, four students that are part of the Community College Initiative Program from Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana, Kenya, and India, and one German student who is here as a participant of the Congress Bundestag Youth Exchange. I cannot be more excited to be a part of this amazing group. Lastly, I would like to thank all of you for allowing us the opportunity to share with you a little bit about SCC's Council of Student Leaders and our plans for this upcoming school year. Now I would like to finish by extending the invitation to all of you to join us at any of our on or off campus events. Thank you. Hi there, my name is Sarah Drennan, and I am the Vice Chair of the Council of Student Leaders at Scottsdale Community College, and it's an honor to be here. Hello, my name is Laura, and my position is student at large. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am Camilla O'Donnell, your Public Relations Co-Manager for the Council of Student Leaders. <laughs> Good evening, I am Salia Fata PC, and I am a student at large. Good evening, I'm Asamoah Fujans Amon, Public Relations Co-Manager at SCC. Good evening everybody, I'm Santoshi from India. I'm a part of Council of Student Leaders at Student at Large. Thank you. Good evening everyone, I am Billy Samuel from Kenya. I'm a part of the Student at Large still, thank you. Hello, I'm Lisa Bustamante and I'm part of the Student at Large. Hi, good evening. My name is Deborah Nkansa, and I'm the Secretary for the Students at Large. Good evening. My name is Wesley Smith, and I am a student at large. Good evening. My name is Gabby Coons, and I'm the Chair of Special Events. If, are there any questions? <laughs> well, thank you. Sorry, I was told someone was going to ask if there's any questions for me, but I'm willing to take any questions. Well, thank you all for coming and for a most interesting report. Are there any comments or questions from board members? <laughs> Ms. Maya? I don't have any questions, but thank you. And if you guys need any help with anything, please feel free to contact me. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. We have two Emeritus Distinction Awards this evening. Dr. Gonzalez, would you like to introduce your honorees? Uh, Dr. Thorne may I invite um, Dr. Amy Diaz up to the podium to introduce our awardees. Please. Thank you. Dr. Diaz is our Interim Vice President of Academic Affairs at Gateway. Good evening, President Thor, members of the board, Chancellor Harper-Marinick, members of CEC, and guests. 
It is my honor to officially recognize two Gateway Community College faculty with emeritus distinction upon your approval. I would like to acknowledge Dr. Margie Schultz's nomination of these two exemplary women. First, we have Dr. Betty Hying Stanley, also known as Dr. Betty. She retired as nursing faculty from Gateway in spring of 2019. Dr. Betty contributed significantly to the nursing discipline in a variety of ways, and to highlight just a few of them, Dr. Betty was the lead faculty for the Nurse Refresher Program as part of the Nursing Continuing Education Department at Gateway for over 20 years. She served as a liaison and advocate for her refresher students at the Arizona State Board of Nursing. As an innovator, she created the continuing education courses of alternative experiences for the nurse refresher students, which included high fidelity simulation, in-person obstetrical and pediatric experiences, as well as the one-on-one -on -one capstone experiences, which she carefully tailored to meet the individual student needs. Finally, as her retirement gift from her peers in the nursing division, a contribution was made to the Borsey Hying Stanley Nurse Refresher Scholarship Fund that was created at Gateway to assist the refresher nursing students with costs such as books and other, other required item, items for the course. If you would please help me in congratulating Dr. Be Dr. Betty and I would ask her to come to the podium. And would you like to make a few brief remarks? Good evening and thank you. This is such an honor to receive this. I have to say, um, I came to Gateway on an interim basis to help out when someone was out on a medical leave and little did I know that it was going to motivate me to stay for like 27 years. <laughs> but it was the best thing I could have done and it um, also motivated me to go back to school and get my doctorate. So it was um, a real honor and a real joy to serve all the students that I've uh, had cross my path along the way and I, I feel like I got more of a gift maybe than even they did because they were just awesome and uh, they touched my heart. A lot of them are friends of mine now so because we're all colleagues in the same profession so uh, it's been a real ple pleasure. Thank you. And next we have Miss Nancy Johnson, who is, uh, has been medical radiography faculty at Gateway and retired as Dean of Professional and Technical Education in July of 2019. Nancy Johnson made significant contributions in several areas at Gateway Community College, where she began as a faculty member in medical radiography. Looking for a new challenge, she served as faculty curriculum development facilitator for several years while maintaining her faculty role. Nancy became a nationally recognized author and speaker within the field of radiography and was recognized as a fellow in the American Society of Radiologic Technologists. She advised student clubs whereby, whereby she fostered the idea that Gateway students had an obligation to the professional community to which they belonged. Finally, Ms. Johnson was instrumental in the creation and facilitation of many new programs and initiatives for Gateway Community College in all of her various roles, but most recently as Dean. Again, if you would please help me in congratulating Nancy Johnson. And if you would like to make a few brief remarks. Good evening. This is a great honor. I've had, <clears throat> excuse me, I've had a long ride here. I had many, many opportunities, which uh, started with challenges. I worked with many different people from different campuses as well as Gateway. Um, I took the challenge to move into administration, which now I'm retired. <laughs> so that tells you that that was a big challenge. Um, but I really enjoyed my teaching. I did that for 25 of the 27 years. Um, that was my love, it wasn't a job. And the people that I worked with knew that. 
and I enjoyed it very much. And I, the greatest thing about retirement is you miss your colleagues. But I thank you so much for the opportunity to have this experience. Congratulations to both of the honorees. We're now at the Chancellor's Report, Dr. Harper Marinick. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Thorne, members uh, of the board. Um, of the um, three presentations uh, we had planned, we um, actually only have one tonight. We had the uh, student uh, awards. One student did not get back into the U.S. from international travel, and the other one is very ill. So they are, um, we're going to ask them to come uh, next month and uh, receive their recognition. And then we're also uh, postponing the presentation on the uh, procurement uh, changes and the uh, contract changes. So we have uh, tonight a presentation on financial aid. And before I introduce uh, Associate Vice Chancellor Felicia Ganther, I would like to just use this opportunity to say thank you to the hundreds of people who have reached out to uh, say thank you and um, best wishes as I move on in my professional career because uh, at times it's been a little bit overwhelming to hear from some people from the district that I thought had retired a long time ago. <laughs> and uh, so it's, it's been a kind of a little journey into the past, but I want to also make sure that everyone knows that my commitment to the mission of community colleges, my commitment to the medical colleges specifically, to equity, to access, and to student success has not been a temporary condition. It is part of who I am, it is part of my DNA, and regardless of what I do in the future, I will always be a champion for community colleges, I will be a champion for equity and access, and I will be a champion for the Maricopa Community Colleges. So thank you for the opportunity to make uh, comments. And I should have said, everyone knows the students is what helps me get up in the morning and do this work, so I love having one of them right next to me uh, <laughs> on the board. And now I would like to ask Associate Vice Chancellor Felicia Ganser to please come to the podium and introduce her team. And what we are uh, going to do tonight is continue the presentations on the transformation and the uh, framework for student success. Uh, last uh, month we heard about recruitment and we heard about uh, some of the changes that we have implemented. So once we have the students uh, trying to access the system. We know the importance of uh, financial aid and financial support. So we would like uh, the board and the public to know all of the improvements that the team has already made. So uh, Felicia, if you would, please introduce the team. President Thor, members of the board, to Chancellor Harper Marinick, Provost Fisher, and to the CEC members. First, let me say thank you for allowing me to be the spokesperson uh, for this particular effort and know that it is not just me, that there is a large uh, a group of individuals who are serving on project teams uh, that are being led by a core team. And so let me introduce them and then I'm going to get into the thick of this uh, presentation. First, I want to introduce our two district directors. We have two sides of the house. One is operations and one is compliance. If we are not in compliance, with the regs of Title IV, uh, we will lose the ability to provide federal financial aid to students, so that's very important. So um, Annette Lenders, who's behind me, would you stand up? Annette is our district director over compliance, and she works under the auspices of legal uh, and student affairs under Melissa Flores. So that's our compliance person. And then our operations person, who's working with four different departments and assisting with the facilitation of work with all of our financial aid directors, as well as IT, is Mr. Ken Clark, who is our district director over financial operations. And then a person whom I love very dearly, I mean, I love all of them, but I love her dearly, <laughs> is because she is a whiz when it comes to data. And she allows us to be able to do very exciting things, knowing how to serve students, where to serve them, and who they are. Um, and that is our director of um, financial aid, and that is Ms. B. Rendon, if you please stand. Uh, no team would be great 
without having somebody to take all the notes and hold us accountable. So I would like to also recognize our administrative support, Ms. Donna Winston. And you can give them a round of applause. So the question is, what are we doing in financial aid? And the answer is we are doing a lot. However, I only have five to seven minutes, so I promise that it'll be entertaining and short. Uh, and I'm gonna get through this. So we wanted to bring to you today just four things that we're working on. And those four things, of course, will have additional um, bullet points, but just know it's only four. So the first one is, that we wanna talk about is just that we are part of uh, what is called the Lost Momentum Framework and how we are working through the various uh, parts of the student life cycle. And I would be remiss if I didn't honor and acknowledge my, my colleagues who are helping with this work. Um, I wanna acknowledge first Keisha Brock who got us set up with financial aid from the district operation. Uh, set me up real nice, so I appreciate you. I really do. Um, and then I wanna honor uh, Mark Cohen and his team. He has loaned us a program manager, Amy Frenner. Um, and they have also uh, labored with us all of our crazy requests, so we thank you very much. We also want to honor um, ABC Bettina Sellis, who has helped us to figure out how to do work around our student information system. Um, and so, and then I want to honor Matt Ashcroft, because he's helping, helping us to understand the data and helping us to create a data dashboard that all of you will be able to see what we're doing. So thank you all very much for your help. Now, here's our first point. Uh, what was astonishing was the fact that Maricopa was awarding financial aid in June. <laughs> and that means that most people have made up their mind about what college they're gonna go to, and unfortunately, Maricopa may not have been their choice because they didn't know that they had been awarded. So here's what we focused on. We're processing financial aid three months earlier, um, this fall, we began awarding two months in advance, in April. We gave students a personalized award notice by email. Uh, we awarded 40,000 uh, students for the fall, and of that, nearly 88% enrolled. What does that equal? Over $32 million in tuition revenue. And I believe that we will get even higher um, because we are going to begin to let students know that uh, we received their financial aid and we're gonna be processing it beginning in November. So we're excited about that. Why does that matter? We've noticed in the trends that if a student gets a notification earlier, they enroll in more credits. And as you can see, a natural fall that's happening. So we wanna award, we wanna notify and award students early so that they can take advantage of uh, the credits that they need. We also noticed that, again, students who are what we consider uh, enrolling during peak, those students have a smaller number of courses that they are able to take due to uh, them being closed. So we also have another thing I wanna talk about, which is the fourth item that we're working on to help with that. So our second thing is that we get a lot of students who are admitted, but they're not using their financial aid. Matter of fact, almost 50% of the students in the state of Arizona who apply for financial aid list one of the Maricopa colleges as one of the colleges that they would like for their information to be sent to. So we are focusing on a lot of outreach efforts over the next year to raise our numbers, um, but we also have looked at our internal structures to ensure that as we are recruiting and we're out, out doing outreach around financial aid, that the process that they experience upon submission of their FAFSA is clean, is clear, and it's easy. So here's what we've been doing. We found that the bottleneck is primarily in the verification process. That's where you have to turn in tax forms and all kinds of things that you may not necessarily know where to find, how to find it, who to deliver it to. 
So the first thing is we started reaching out to those students and we started giving them information ahead of time so that they would know how to access the information that they needed to turn in. Then we um, did outreach calls to those students to find out where they were stuck and how we could help them. But the magical thing, and all of you remember, I think uh, Governor Board Hendricks uh, made a statement about having to turn in these forms at the colleges and it taking so long to get through the verification process. We have installed scanners at all of the colleges, high speed, high privacy protection scanners, so that if a student or a family member walks up to a counter, it's scanned immediately and the verification center receives it immediately. Then both sides can see what was sent, what was received, and what's available for the student to see. Finally, we did a strategic enrollment campaign with the help of the contact center, um, and we reached out to students, and we netted 1,014 students from that outreach campaign, which generated over $800,000 in tuition revenue. That's pretty good, huh? <laughs> All right. All right. When we looked at how we communicate with students, we found that all of our communications were very transactional, which means that when a student did a particular thing within the student information system related to financial aid, that triggered a communication. But that communication was through what's called the message center. So there was a chance that the student may or may not have read that particular message. So we decided that we wanted to focus on the total financial aid life cycle. Here's some things that we've done. First of all, we had to simplify our process. We simplified it to five steps to help the student understand what are the five things they need to do in order to uh, ascertain financial aid from our district. Second, we looked at all of our communications and we've identified the seven most important proactive communications that starts with, hi, we've received your FAFSA form all the way down to high, you're being awarded X amount of dollars. We have 27 more in the pipe? 21. 21. So we have 20 more, 21 more communications that we are currently putting into the, the CRM communication customer relationship management system uh, that will be used to help students understand where they are in the cycle when they're going to receive their money, how they're going to receive their money, and if there are any issues that we need to address. The other thing, uh, and this is uh, one of my desires, is I believe that uh, we have a, a, a community of students who like to watch videos, right? <laughs> and I know that I like to watch videos. So if you can give me the information that you're typing in a letter to me, in a video format that I can watch in 60 to 90 seconds, I'd rather watch that video. So we are uh, putting in a tool called Financial Aid TV, and it is a set of videos that are available to show students all the different steps. And we are going to have all of those videos in Spanish. It's very important for us to ensure that not only the student, but their family understands all of the various parts of financial aid. Uh, our other goal is to decrease the number of calls going into the financial aid call center, which is um, being run by Blackboard. I'm happy to report that the work that we've done thus far has decreased the calls by 30, almost 31 percent, which is a savings of over 170,000, and particularly very proud of the fact that we've decreased the number of calls during peak enrollment. That means during July and August. So we are extremely, extremely happy about that. So this is just an example of what um, Financial Aid TV looks like um, and how it uh, will be a part of the Maricopa system. We're going to do some branding of each of the colleges and we'll have some specific uh, videos that are going to be pertaining to each college, but we're really excited about this partnership. Then, this is the final one. And I brought a, a young lady. She said, 
She's a little nervous, but I told her she was going to do all right uh, to speak a little bit about this. Um, before I bring her up, I want to explain why this is important. Remember uh, the, the, the bar graph that I showed you, where this, depending on when the student fills out their financial aid, they have a higher uh, course enrollment? Well, one of the items that we feel is very important is to be able to ensure that any student who wants to use their financial aid at any college within our system, they can do that. That means if they find that they can't get into all the courses that they want at Glendale Community College, they can enroll at Estrella Mountain or Rio Salado or Phoenix College. Why is that important? Because we want to make sure that students find everything they need within the 10 colleges that are serving them. So portability of financial aid is critical. That means the student can enroll at one college and say, I want to take a course over here and they're able to easily and quickly transition that request without having to do a lot. Well, unfortunately, our current process requires them to do a lot. It requires them to drive between the two colleges, take a form, have each area fill it out, have an academic advisor at the receiving college determine whether or not the student can take the class, and then they have to pray that the paper doesn't get lost. <laughs> so, here's what we've done. We needed to make sure that if we were gonna have portability of financial aid, we had to pilot it somewhere. So we thank Dr. Leba Ruiz for being the pilot college. We did an online consortium agreement, which is what the uh, Department of Ed requires us to do when students are taking uh, financial aid between two colleges. Um, and we created an electronic version of it. That means the student only goes to the college, which, which is their home college, fills out the information and is electronically sent. Everything is approved at the receiving college, comes back to the home college, and then the funds are transferred. Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> so. Before I conclude, I'd like to ask Victoria Wilson if she'd come forward. She is a student at Glendale Community College, and she's going to share her story with you. Good evening, <laughs> President Thor, members of the board, Dr. Harper Marinick, members of the CEC, and guests. My name is Victoria Wilson, and I am a student at GCC, and I am going to be telling you my experience with the consortium agreement. Um, experiencing getting a consortium agreement for the first time was really overwhelming. I had to get an agreement from Glendale Community College, which was a paper. You know what? I'm not going to use this. So I had to get a paper, and I was told by the advisor, well, I had to wait in line. That was like a long time. And I had to, they told me that I had to take this paper all the way to Rio Salado. So that was one of the colleges that I was going to go to. And I was shocked that I had to drive all the way summer mm -hmm. with no AC in my car. Mm. So we all know what Arizona heat can do to us. Um, <laughs> brutal. So I drove all the way over there. I had to wait again to sit in this line and wait for the advisor there to sign it and make sure that it was credited to the three to six credits that I needed to do this consortium agreement. Then I had to drive all the way back to GCC <laughs> to sit again, wait, to, for an advisor to sign my paper and then have it processed, which took about five to 10 days. Now, I, it was hard, especially during summer with driving back and forth with no AC. I didn't know that it was going to be like that for my very first time around. But then, come the second year, I had to, um, so I applied for classes and I didn't have a class that was open at GCC, but it was open at Phoenix College. So I was like, Oh, wonderful. Another consortium agreement that I have to drive. <laughs> and so I went in and wanted, I waited 
and I went to financial aid and I said, okay, hi, I need a consortium agreement for Phoenix College. And the lady said, oh, you know you can do this online now. And I was like, what? <laughs> She's like, yeah, I'll show you how to do it. So I, she took me to a computer and she's like, all you gotta do is fill this out and it will, uh, you just fill it out, it sends off to Phoenix College, they sign it, and then they email it right back and it was processed. And it was processed in 24 hours. And I think that that was beautiful, <laughs> to be honest. I was like, wow, really? <laughs> so, um, I mean, coming from the first time around from doing it for, you know, it took like almost four hours out of my day to drive back and forth to where I just sat there and got it done within 10 minutes and it was complete. And I was very happy. Annette helped me and I was very satisfied with the help. And in the end, I was able to start at Phoenix College for the first day. I really do think that this will help us in the future for our future students who do these agreements. And it puts a lot more less stress on us and we're not very overwhelmed. And I believe that this program will go far and I am looking forward to using it again. Thank you. She did a good job, didn't she? Yeah. yeah. So with the electronic uh, transfer consortium agreement, uh, we had um, 51 students who participated in it, and we were able to process the majority of them within a 24-hour process. And what was exciting is that we created an additional communication strategy just to keep those students abreast of where their application was throughout the process. So we are very excited about that and we look forward to expanding that uh, to all of our colleges in the next year. Um, before I close, again, thank you to the team um, that has been working on this. But I would like to uh, also acknowledge our uh, faculty representatives. Keith, you've been great. Thank you for making sure we have faculty representation on all of our uh, committees, um, particularly because we are starting a faculty communication process so that we can help uh, to inform and provide information to faculty who are helping students uh, who are uh, experiencing financial troubles. We also are creating an, a FAFSA outreach uh, and we are creating a financial wellness um, project. So we are very, very busy uh, and we hope to have an even, even more exciting presentation next year when we share four additional things that we are doing. At this time, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Comments or questions from the board? Dr. Narini? We, we didn't coordinate this, but first you have to FAFSA. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Uh, yeah, so FAFSA opens up next Wednesday, That's so right. all the students get out, apply, and get those FAFSAs completed. We are working with uh, Dr. April Osborne um, to do a FAFSA completion project with all of the high schools that are participating. And we also have a uh, financial aid outreach team that we're going to be doing another, uh, I call it jazzy, events in the community to support FAFSA completion. Uh, and we are circling it as we don't care where you go, we just want to help you. But by the way, Maricopa is here to help you too. <laughs> well, thank you very thank much. You. And particularly thank you. <laughs> we are now at Citizens Interim. This is an opportunity for members of the public to address the governing board about items that are not on the agenda for discussion today. In compliance with the open meeting law, the governing board will neither discuss nor take action on issues raised during this portion of the agenda. Each speaker is asked to limit their comments to three minutes. We have six speakers tonight. I believe they're all on the same topic or similar topic. The first one is Stephanie Senato. Good evening. Uh, President Thor, members of the board, Dr. Harper Marinak, members of CEC and guests. My name is Stephanie Senato. 
I'm a graduate from ASU. Um, I finished in 2011 with a bachelor's in kinesiology. I was a student of Estrella Mountain Community College uh, between 2017 and 19, doing some prereqs for medical school, which I'm applying to in the spring. Um, I'm a first-time generation college student, and while at EMCC, I served as an officer on Phi Theta Kappa, was on the Honors Society, or on the Honors Advisory Board as a student and an Honors Achievement Awardee. Um, I'm presenting to you today as an alumni at EMCC. In the spring of 2018, I had the distinct pleasure, along with uh, two other students, to travel to Harvard University um, to present my research. We presented on the purposes community colleges serve in our communities and attempting to break down the negative stigma that is so often associated with community colleges, especially those that serve students of color. Um, in addition, presenting at the conference, we were immersed in a different culture. I mean, we traveled Boston, we attended a musical cultural event, but most importantly, we talked to students um, that attended there about their struggles and how they could never imagine uh, that they would be students thriving at Harvard. That also came from community colleges. Um, they were inspiring, to say the least. Uh, without a doubt, there is a purpose and critical significance to student travel. There's something that being immersed in the world around you, around culture, around greatness, and around new things never seen before that are earth-moving and eye-opening that a classroom cannot replicate. For me, that trip was more than a school field trip. It changed who I was, it changed who I wanted to be, and it changed my doubts and fears into hope and empowerment. I believe my story and my experience are empowering, and I'm not the only one who was changed by that event. However, I'm also very confused as to why it took us over 18 months, we've been waiting a really long time to get in front of you about this, to come and present to you on why we had to use the public forum part of the governing board meeting to address you, rather than be invited by our college president or chancellor, despite repeated attempts to request time to speak. One would think that MCCCD, sending three students and two instructors to Harvard, would be something that you as the governing board would be, and would be excited about and want to celebrate. Um, we presented at Harvard about the importance of community colleges, where we showcased and highlighted EMCC. Um, we needed the support of Chancellor Harper Marinak to override EMCC administrators who voted unanimously to block the Harvard travel, which was unprecedented. And this was not a funding issue. Honors was funding this event since all of the students that attended were honors students. This trip was approximately 4% of the total honors budget, and uh, had more, we had more than 160000 in the 2017-18 budget. This was not a budget issue. And because I asserted my right as a student to inquire by EMCCC administrators when they prevented me from attending, um, I just felt I was further targeted, in my opinion. Um, I feel that EMCC administrators uh, prevented me from attending NYSOD to present my research, and uh, even going as far as to checking to make sure that I wasn't there. Um, I just believe that it just takes us a really long time to get here, and so that's what we were able to present about. And my daughter is actually gonna finish my piece for me since I hit the three minutes. What is your name? Uh, Anik Larkin. Okay. President Thor, members of the board, Dr. Harper Marinick, members of the CEC and guests, my name is Anik and I'm 15 years old. My mother is Stephanie Arce who spoke to you about the Harbor trip. I will be continuing to read the rest of her remarks given that she ran out of time as we expected because she and the others were not given the courtesy of a presentation to interact with the board as is usually provided by the college president and or chancellor. I'm here because I think what happened was wrong. Why is it that the governing board is not hearing about this Harvard trip until October 2019 when we traveled in spring 2018? It's a question that needs to be asked, especially since you as a new governing board assured the public of greater transparency in January of 2019. I respectfully ask for an investigation into this matter immediately as to why there was such scrutiny on this particular Harvard trip, why EMCC administrators and others did not allow us to present to the governing board, why student travel was further banned for EMCC students in the summer of 2018 that prevented our EMCC PTK group from traveling to the Honors Institute despite having funds to pay for the travel, and no other active PTK within the Maricopa County Community College District was prevented from attending the Honors Institute which speaks of possible discriminatory behavior that is against federal regulations for institutions receiving federal funds, and why EMCC administrators worked fervently, in my opinion, to make sure that I did not attend NYSOD, despite that I was going to fund myself. EMCC should be held accountable for the barriers they created and the lack of leadership they provided, and for the fact that their vision and purpose for student success was definitely not reflected. Despite the Chancellor assuring me and others at the Chancellor Student Forum in February 2019 at EMCC that Dr. Laura would meet with us, this meeting never transpired. I must respectfully say that that's not leadership. The number of leadership issues are too many to count. 
We had to use this platform to speak out. I am here advocating for greater transparency and an investigation to this issue because I believe that the Harvard trip is the type of experience that, EA, that MCCCD sorry, students should be afforded. It changed my life and inspired many at our campus and beyond after we presented at EMCC about our experience. I am asking that you respectfully as the governing board to look into this matter with an independent investigator outside of MCCCD for complete transparency and that the investigation not be privileged by attorney-client, but that it be released to the public to fulfill your values of transparency, integrity, honesty, responsibility, and excellence. I'm asking you respectfully to continue this conversation and to propose for this issue to be placed on the next agenda for discussion. I want to end by saying that as an upcoming college generation, we are watching. We are aware of the challenges that my mom and others had to endure at EMCC and wondering why we should attend any colleges within the Maricopa County Community College District, given how leadership failed in the case of this Harvard trip and that my mother was prevented from presenting at NISON. I, NISOD. I am hopeful that you as a governing board will address this issue to the fullest extent. Thank you. Alyssa Guerra. President Thor, members of the board, Dr. Harper Marnik, members of CEC and guests, my name is Alyssa Guerra. I am currently a student work at ASU working towards my Bachelor's of Arts in Education. I'm a first generation student. I was enrolled at Australia Mountain Community College from the spring of 2016 to the fall of 2019. During my time on campus, I was a service officer and president of Phi Theta Kappa. I was awarded the Chancellor's Medallion along with the Gold President Service Award. I earned my Associate in Arts degree, General Education degree, and Certificate in Chicano Studies. All of my hard work and dedication at the community college helped contribute to my success and the fact that I am a recipient of the Chicano for La Casa scholarship that covers full tuition at ASU. None of this would have been possible without the incredible opportunity that I had to present at Harvard University. As an education major, we learn a lot about the academic challenges that some adolescents face. I was one of those students. Community college felt like a second chance to accomplish what I thought was impossible, and I did. I presented at Harvard University. Seeing the campus, interacting with students, and speaking with faculty and getting to voice my experiences and research was a life-changing experience. The world becomes so much bigger when an opportunity like this is presented to a student like me. Since that life-changing experience, I'm co-authoring a book chapter on my experiences at the community college, a part of ASU's prestigious honors program, and continuing to influence my youth in the community. However, this is not without consequence. I want to bring to your attention today that similar to what Jean Wilcox reported in her May 2018 report of case number 17-031, expanded investigation report number five on sexual harassment cases and responses of Rio Salado College and Administration. I believe that the problems she identified at Rio are those that I encountered at EMCC. Wilcox stated that others said that they felt accused, the accused harasser gets support from administration in preparing responses, but they are left on their own to figure out the processes and their rights. I, excuse me. As a student, I filed two Title IX cases. The first one involved a male student who groped me on EMCC property without my consent. The case was never investigated to my knowledge, despite my repeated inquiries and petitions for the case to be investigated. The second case I filed was against an administrator at EMCC who, in my opinion, was retaliating against me for my involvement in the Harvard trip, similar to Stephanie's experience where she was prevented from attending a research conference. The external investigator informed me that the case was concluded on January 4th, 2019, citing no wrongdoing, even though key witnesses were not interviewed, and the main witnesses interview was not conducted fully until 18 days after the investigator came up with her findings. This doesn't make sense unless they never had any intention to conduct a thorough investigation or they came up with conclusions without considering all of the evidence. I gave concrete examples of the inconsistencies in investigators' findings when I submitted a 48-page appeal letter, but reconsideration was denied. Wilcox found in her investigation that administrators at Rio Salado knew about the harassment but did nothing but provide an environment that put accusers at further risk because of the administrators' inactions to address the harassment. Similarly, I argue that EMCC administrators were aware of the harassment, did nothing because they accused of the high-ranking administrator. I strongly feel that I was not assisted at a time that I needed it the most. And as a youth counselor, I cannot in good conscience steer my students to EMCC or other MCCD community colleges until the governing board listens to these matters further to make sure that all students are protected, especially against an abuse of power by administrators. Respectfully, I am asking, as there are members of my community here that join me tonight for an investigation to EMCC's procedures regarding sexual harassment and why my first case is not investigated. Thank you. <laughs> Selena Venegas. We had asked for uh, Laura Hernandez to go first. My apologies. Thank you.
President Thor, members of the board, Dr. Harper Marinick, members of the CEC and guests, my name is Norman Hernandez, and I serve as the Honors Director at Estrella Mountain Community College in the 2017-18 academic year, and was instrumental in facilitating the Harvard trip. I want to read a letter by Dr. Catherine Bowles, first distinguished faculty member from Harvard's Graduate School of Education, and I'm here today as a public citizen. Quote, Norma's recent work at Estrella Mountain Community College came to my attention during the spring semester of 2018. When Norma presented her research and the results of her work at EMCC at Harvard's prestigious Alumni of Color Conference. I've been deeply involved with this conference since its inception over 15 years ago, and I have attended innumerable alumni presentations at the conference. I have never attended a presentation as powerful as Norma's, end quote. And if any board member or member of the CSC would like to contact Dr. Bowles personally, I can forward you her contact information per your request. I taught at EMCC for six years. My credentials include more than 20 years teaching in the K through 8th grade, community college, four-year public and private, and graduate level institutions. I'm a, Sp a former Spencer Dissertation Fellow, a Kika de la Garza Fellow through the United States Department of Agriculture, an MCLI Research Fellow, have presented and published in respectable journals such as the Harvard Ed Review, conducted research in Latin America, and hold graduate degrees from Harvard University as well as UC Berkeley. I came to teach at a Hispanic serving community college because I felt the calling a sense of wanting to serve students who were just like me. Latinx, first generation, child of immigrants, with the hope that an education would provide a pathway to a better life. Despite my Harvard advisor's warnings to not teach at a community college because it was beneath me, I came because I believed that this is where I should be, not stuck in an ivory tower somewhere where my work would only be digested by the elite. My hope was to connect MCCCD to Harvard University, and through this trip, I did. Our presentation had such a positive impact that we were asked to present in other venues at Harvard, but my time at MCCD was cut short as my residential faculty contract was not renewed in May 2019, in part due to this Harvard trip. In my opinion, despite the myriad of accolades that I collected during my tenure at EMCC, including being nominated for the Faculty Shines Award, leading MCCCD's initiative on tackling food and housing insecurity, and, and securing a $5,000 grant to do just that, the only person in Arizona to secure such a grant, and having several of my students go on to institutions like USC and Occidental College to complete their undergraduate studies. The Harvard trip was a success for our students, without a doubt, but it was professionally disastrous for me as a faculty member because it led to a series of events, including false accus accusations that were disproven by an outside investigator, Miss Melissa Julian. Unfortunately, those same accusations that were proven to have no merit were used to justify the non-renewal of my contract. Respectfully, I implore you to investigate the issue as to why EMCC administrators blocked student travel and why Chancellor Harper Marinick had to intervene so that we could present at Harvard University in hopes that such opportunities are not withheld from future students at any MCCD institution. I urge you to investigate why PTK students at EMCC were, presented for, were prevented from traveling to the Honors Institute, although other PTK students from MCCD traveled to the Honors Institute in the summer of 2018, and why Stephanie, despite having the funds to travel to NYSOC, was prohibited from traveling to present at a conference, conference attended by many MCC administrators. Selena Venegas will conclude my remarks. President Thor, members of the board, Dr. Harper Marinick, members of the CS CEC and guests, my name is Selena Venegas, an alum of EMCC. I am also an alum of Occidental College and currently working as a researcher in the greater Phoenix area. I am here to continue reading Dr. Hernandez's statement given that her time was limited in the citizens interim. I feel that these statements need to be recorded and appreciate the time afforded to do so. The two faculty members associated with this endeavor, Laura Fry, who was executive assistant to former EMCC president, Dr. Lara, and myself are no longer employed at MCCCD. And I think it behooves us as a community to ask why and how the Harvard trip played a role in this. The harassment I am alleging that Professor Fry and I endured took a great toll on our health individually, and even though I was warned by federal investigator that my institution would attempt to make my life miserable and told don't quit whatever they do don't quit i persisted because i knew that eventually the truth would come out these matters merit an independent investigation as well as other matters at emcc that included inappropriate behavior of from a former honors director that he where he intentionally misled students to stay in honors to increase college funding 
which is supported by student testimonies and the inappropriate actions of an EMCC counselor to engage in a romantic relationship with the student he was counseling, who still holds a position of authority over students at EMCC. Alyssa Guerrero's case is only one of several that seem to have been swept under the rug and our community deserves better than a statement declaring that MCCCD will not waive attorney-client privilege. Accountability is a cornerstone, corn, cornerstone of leadership and transparency. Dr. Narini, as a school counselor and someone who has advocated for students and their educational opportunities, I implore you to not let these issues fall by the wayside, but to support an, investi an investigation into these matters. Respectfully, it is in your hands now as the governing board to call for and support such investigation. Moreover, I respectfully ask the governing board to waive MCCCD's attorney-client privilege in the case investigated by Melissa Miss Melissa Julian against me in spring 2019, which I believe was fabricated after informed after I informed EMCC that I had filed a federal EEO case of discrimination. Although the investigator did not find the factual allegations set forth in the amended complaint to be sustained, nor that Dr. Hernandez violated any provision of Title IX Administrative Regulation 6.7 or Appendix H with respect to those factual allegations, my faculty contract was not renewed for some reason of these for the sun for some of these reasons. Additionally, MCCCD will not waive attorney-client privilege so that I may receive the entire investigative report. Thank you. Jose Gonzalez. President Thor, members of the board, Dr. Harper Martinick, members of the CEC and guests, my name is Jose Gonzalez and I am a EMCC alumni in the 2017 through 2019 academic year. I will continue reading the letter from Dr. Hernandez. More than 20 members of the public, I believe, have re requested an entire investigation report and M MCCD continues to not waive attorney-client privilege. If there is nothing nefarious of the report and shows that there was no wrongdoing on my part, why wouldn't MCCD release the report? We're living in a times where, when transparency gains public trust, while withholding information leads to the public to believe that MCCD may have something to hide. Please do something. Do not maintain the status quo because our students and communities cannot afford for the status quo to be maintained. Thank you. I have copies of the three statements for the, the different members of the governing board. missing several copies. We now move to consideration of the consent agenda items. All items with an asterisk are consent matters unless they are removed from the consent agenda at this time. Do any board members or the chancellor wish to remove any items from the consent agenda? I would like to remove 9.5. There's been a request to remove 9.5. 
Dr. Nerini. And I'd like to request to move, uh, remove 11.4. 11.4 is being removed. Any others? <laughs> is there a motion to approve the consent agenda with the exception of 9.5 and 11.4? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, I'll call first for the advisory vote. Board vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The consent agenda passes 7-0. We now move to 9.5, approve the resolution of the governing board regarding creation of the new faculty agreement. Mrs. Wynn. I believe originally that the fact council was supposed to have this done by the end of December and this asks, asks for an extension till the end of February. I'd be, um, I'd like to see at the end of January, so give a month extension, but to try to keep as close to the original goal as possible. Um, I, I know the group just came together just when school started, but I, I believe that a lot of good work is being done, but I'd like to see them stay on a strict schedule. If at the end of February or January they don't have what they need, we could extend at that time, but I'd like to see them try to meet the January deadline. And I failed to ask for a motion and a second on 9.5 before we address your issue. Oh, sorry. I move that we, I move that we amend this. I, I believe we need to um, move the original motion first. Oh. I move that we uh, consider 9.5. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. So um, your request is to amend this to uh, have first read in January and second read or adoption in February? Mm. No. no. That's not what I'm saying. No. Um, first read in Dece December and adoption in January. That was the original timeline? That was the original timeline. Correct. All right, then I'll say yes. To your, what you just said, I, I want. I, I don't want it to extend to February. But is, is there a way that we we were, our meeting in, in December is the beginning of December? Is the that, issue. that is correct. So if you stay with the current timeline, they will have to complete their work in time to uh, for agenda review, which is going to be late November, uh, for first read on December the tenth and action January the 24th. So you have a long dead period between the December 5th meeting and the January 24th board meeting. I think it's January 21st, but. Oh, okay, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> the fourth Tuesday. So I believe what you're wanting to propose is that it be first read in January an action in February so as to allow for the, the long period uh, yes. in December? Yes. Are there, for, I have some comments, but are there other comments or questions on, so are, are you moving that? I'm moving that the first read be January 21st, 2020, and that it be finalized in February. Is there a second? Okay, guys, for lack of a second. So back to the original motion, uh, Mr. Sar. Similar to that, I, you know, we're, we're really guilty of kicking the can down the road, and this is another one, and I totally get the situation timing-wise, but I also don't necessarily think that by December we have to have the entire uh, document complete and in front of us. I, I think there are priorities on that document. Obviously, compensation is certainly one of them, and how we compensate 
is part of that. And I think that's a subject that's going to take much more than a month or two or three. So I would rather that this group focus their attention on these compensation issues between now and uh, December and give us um, their document that covers that portion of this long-term agreement and then continue on working on it uh, on the rest of the agreement hence. But I just, um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I get the situation, but I also know we make it very easy to, to make these kind of changes and I'd better stick to the original schedule, maybe modifying what we see at that point in time, but um, I, I just don't want to see us continue. We'll never get this done. Well, your order, Madam Chairman, we've not had a motion. We're not allowed to discuss we something. We do have a motion. We do? We do? Uh -huh. uh, the motion was, the original motion was made by Mrs. Wynn. My amendment failed. Thank so you. The original motion. Yeah, appreciate that. Thank you. So, Mr. Saar, you're proposing that uh, we provide more guidance to FACT and alter the expectation that they would have a complete document ready for us in now January. Yeah, I, I, I don't honestly believe that it would be uh, a time to get the entire document and yeah. knowing that it's 100 plus pages long. In, in just a few months. So I'd rather they concentrate on, on the most important parts of it in my mind and then we'll continue working with them as time goes on to make sure that by the end of June that we have a uh, full document that we've had a chance to look at and, and approve or not. I see. Uh, so if I understand you, you're suggesting then that uh, they, they bring what they can in January and that they continue working through the spring, recognizing that the existing RFP expires June 30th. So might require some extension of parts of the agreement that have not yet been addressed? Well, like I said, there are parts of that agreement that in my mind are more important than others, uh -huh. that um, we need to have that discussion as a board with FACT uh, throughout the process. And I think if we take part of it at a time so that by the December meeting, if they bring us the um, uh, portion of that document that they have feel they they can present to us, that's fine with me. And throughout the next six months, they can bring uh, the balance of it each month to us and we can hopefully by the end of June have approved all those different elements of this document. Comment, comments or questions from board members? I, I have a comment. Please. It's more clarification. What I'm trying to both appreciate and understand is after we had a work session with the teams, we heard strong recommendations and guidance to us as a board that in order to accomplish the components that are important to the entire agreement, there was more time needed to ensure that we would have the most comprehensive, thorough document to review and that you saw passing that on, you, the, the groups presenting, found that passing it on to the chancellor by February 18, 2020 was feasible. Is that a correct thing before I go on to my next question, comment? Was that what I, did I understand that correctly? Asking me? Yeah. Well, I'm asking anyone to answer me, frankly. <laughs> you know, I, I honestly don't think that they'll have a complete document ready for us in January. Okay. So having Perfect. something to us that they feel is ready for us may only necessitate a, a few major priorities of that document. I think that we did recognize that it was going to be a work in progress and that FACT would need to continue on in other uh, academic years. In fact, we have to have some kind of process into perpetuity. Correct. So, so to that point then, what I heard from the committee though was that just extending what was feasible for us to look, like, look at with those caveats that Mr. Sars is talking about in terms of there will always be pieces 
for us to review in your review, the request was made that we look at offering a couple more months in order to achieve that best piece of work with the understanding that there will be further things to consider as we go along, which would then include a compensation package, strategy, whatever. So if that, so where I'm stuck is recognizing, not stuck, where I recognize the need to constantly be in communication, to appreciate where you are and have the updates where the, the groups are. But it seems to me if we want to honor the best work that this group will present to us and they're asking for something um, to be extended to go to the chancellor no later than February 18, not jeopardizing our approval date in order to get training and everything for implementation in July 1, it seems that that is a request we should honor. So for me, I would stand in support of the resolution with the dates currently indicated, recognizing that we will constantly be provided updates so we can stay aligned and in conversation and also recognizing it's a work in progress. Does anyone disagree with that, Dr. Narini? I, I think it's uh, like my mom always said, when we, if we don't have time to do it right, when we are going to have time to do it over. Um, <laughs> so I think, I think that's what we're, we're getting to here. So let's take the time to do it right so that we don't have to try to do it over. So are you proposing a different set of dates? What's on here? Okay. Any other comments? Okay. Um, advisory vote? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Uh, board vote? All those in favor say aye. Uh, aye. aye. Opposed? The motion passes 5-2 with Mrs. Wynn and Mr. Saar voting no. We are now at 11.4, Dr. Narini. Uh, thank you, um, Dr. Thor. So help me with the process. Do we have to make a, a motion? Uh, thank you. Uh, it's the proposed course fee Special fee changes for fiscal year 2019-20. Uh, is there a motion? So moved. Second? Second. It's been moved and seconded, Dr. Narini. Okay, uh, yeah, I was looking, as I was looking over these, because I, I love to pour over tedious um, dollar signs, it got, it got me thinking, what can, what, what can students reasonably expect in exchange for their tuition? Can, can they expect well-trained faculty? Can they expect well-equipped classrooms and high-quality education? I think so. I, I think we have well-trained faculty. But do we provide the academic departments the resources that they need to provide our students a high-quality education that they expect and deserve? If we, if we, do, if we are providing our academic departments with, with those kind of resources, then why are we asking students to pay additional fees? for things like copies and pens and pencils and, and to maintain our equipment. And if we're not providing our academic departments with, with the resources they need, why are we as a board not providing our departments the, the resources they need? Why are we asking our students to do our job? Before we get into the whole discussion about equipment, supplies, consumables, let me just say I understand, I really do understand the difference between those and the way our, our system's set up. I also understand that some programs are inherently more expensive than other programs. And some of those, those um, graduates from those programs will go on to make a lot more money than the, the less expensive programs. Another thing I want to make clear before we go on is I'm not questioning the need for the, for the, the funds that are generated from these fees. I think that the, the faculty and, and, the, and the departments uh, need these additional resources to, provide, to do the job of providing our students with the, with the high quality education that, that they deserve. What I am questioning is why we're not doing our job to provide those departments with the resources that they need to do their jobs, and we're putting it onto the students. 
Why do we insist on playing this, this shell game with the students and telling them we brag on one hand that our, our tuition is $85 a credit hour, and on the other hand, we slap the students with a fee to, to pay for those things. Over two thirds of our classes have fees. It just seems deceptive and unfair. No one likes fees, not the staff who have to administer them, not the, the faculty who have to request them, not the students who have to pay for them, and not this board member who has to approve them. I'm not suggesting there's a quick and easy way to, to adequately fund our courses, but I, what I am suggesting is there might be a better solution, a more transparent solution, an honest solution to our students and our community. So what I'd like to propose today is a substitute motion. I still have a lot of questions about the fees, and a lot of, a lot of them, uh, I mean, there's 85 pages of these fees. Uh, what I'd like to do is, I, I propose that we accept the fees as they are tonight and, and ask the Chancellor to put together a task force to examine the resources that our courses need to do their job and how those needs are, are calculated and how best we can meet those needs. Uh, maybe the task force will come back and find out that, hey, these fees are the best, way, the best thing we've got. Or maybe they'll come back with some new model, some Amazon Prime model or, or Swarthmore College model. Of, of funding our, our classes and doing what, what we need to do to help our faculty give the students the, the education that they deserve. Because either way, I know the one thing I do know is that we have a lot of intelligent, creative, and, and hardworking faculty and staff uh, in our college. And I think I'm more confident if with, with a committee or a task force to look this over and, and come back with some ideas that I'll be more comfortable with, with having, having these, the courses funded the way they need to be funded so that our students get the, the education that they deserve. So Dr. Narini has proposed a, an amended a motion that approves the course fee and special changes to take effect in 1920 and uh, calls upon the chancellor to create a task force to, to let's see, to uh, assess the needs, the resource needs of, of all of our courses, to develop a way to calculate those needs accurately, and to figure out the best way to, to meet those needs. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Narini has made a motion. Is there a second? Second. Okay, it's second. been moved and seconded. Uh, comments or questions on the proposed amended motion? I just have a question. So if I'm looking at this, it says new fees $50. Um, the second one down, or new, fee, new course is 26, new fees $50. Is that, is that, is that I'm, am I reading? No, I'm, I'm looking at, at, at it, it's this. It's this. 85 pages. Okay. So it, I'm assuming someone went through a lot of work to determine so you now want to create another task force to analyze the work that was already done to create the increase in fees that don't seem to me to be extreme or arduous. You're asking that somebody else now take all their time, which we're paying those hours, um, and a lot of time and energy to reanalyze what we're being presented, which obviously, clearly, someone put a lot of work into this, so we now need to redo it. We're, we're second-guessing this? Is that what I'm hearing? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Uh, when, when the fees are going up 100, 200, 300, 400 percent, yes, yes, I think we do need to, to, to look them over. Here, let, let me, I, I brought some, a little prop, if you will. Let me, let me show you. Just to, just to demonstrate what we're doing, last, a couple weeks ago, we all went to, uh, up to, Payson went to the winery. This is what twenty dollars looks like to us. Here's what here's what ten dollars looks like to students. <laughs> I love this. Yeah, so yes, I think we need to, to to do our due diligence and give the students what they deserve. And, and give the faculty and the, and the departments what they need to make sure that our students get what they deserve. So as I understand what you're proposing, the chancellor would create a task force that would look at uh, what, a, what courses cost and what alternatives to fees might be possible. Alternatives, so just, to, fun, uh, alternatives to funding those courses. Such as grants, raising it, raising tuition across the board to conclude everything. Um, 
having a, okay. Yeah. Uh, may I ask Dr. Please. Marini a question? Please. In your interest uh, to form a task force, given that the budget for next year is already being reviewed, would you recommend that a tax, is your recommendation that task force be convened now for a year of study so that by the time we get into, would it be 22? the 22 year budget, we would then have a response. So there's no interruption of fees, obviously for this year or for the coming year's budget, but the one following, Correct. which gives us time to do what you're asking. To have the task force present us with some options. But it has a year yes. because of the budget cycle. Correct. I'm looking at, <laughs> yes, what, may we have it, <laughs> thank you. Okay, uh, the fees that are being talked about tonight would go into effect for the spring semester. In January, we would come back with any other fee changes that the colleges would want for the fall semester, where their first read is in January and then adoption in February. So thank you very much. So then what you would be asking for is an evaluation a year from now for the following spring. Spring? I think he's Thought? saying that in January, he's going to present us, January 2020, he's going to present us fee changes for fall 2020. Correct. I understand that. But the task force would have a longer period of time, so we would be looking at it a year from now for the following spring, is what I'm saying, to remove the immediate pressure of solve this in three months. It, it, is that your time frame? Okay, thank you. And Dr. Marini, I, I think it's an amazing, I, I think it's an amazing exp explanation of what you just said. I mean, we are, we are in a community college. Our goal is to have as low, in, low um, estimates for the students, and I think that's a great explanation. Thank you. Looks like my closet. Your closet. <laughs> Any other comments? So we will... Uh, yes, I have yes, Mrs. McGrath. Uh, I think we're working with the money that we have now. We don't have any excess. And if we want to take the fees off of the students and put them on the taxpayers, that's going to be an increase in taxes. I really think that we are probably offering these classes that have fees uh, at very reasonable rates. I know that we have the lowest nursing course fees in the country. That's why we have a two and three year wait for people to get into our nursing school because our fees are so low, our tuition is so low. And uh, I think that this is, these fees that are being charged are only fair. For instance, there's a fee here for a hiking course. I don't think we need a hiking course for any degree whatsoever. And uh, I just think this is a poor idea. I think we've already put a lot of work into the budget and I'd like to see it stay the way it is. I'm looking at some of these and current fee is 20, proposed fee is 40, so it's a change of $20. And over a semester's time, um, I, I, I'm thinking that maybe some of these are not really that big of a change, but some of them are. There are some that are substantial, <coughs> like $700. I think maybe, as opposed to the whole thing, maybe go through and, 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 and not <coughs> ask that everything be analyzed, but maybe the ones that are particularly arduous. Okay, I, I, think, I think you're misunderstanding what, uh, what, I'm, what I'm proposing. <coughs> okay. Is that the whole structure needs to be looked at. Not, not individual yeah, fees for individual classes, but the whole structure of how we fund the classes. Because the reason we're asking for these fees is so that the professors can provide the education that the students deserve, Absolutely. right? They, they need these extra pens, pencils, um, Stethoscopes, whatever, whatever it is they're asking for, they need those to, to provide the quality of education. My question is, is it on the students? Uh, do we, are, are we being fair and transparent to the students by saying, hey, it's eighty-five dollars a credit hour? Oh, but by the way, we have to, we're going to charge you uh, this additional fee. We, as a board, need to be bold enough that if, if it's going to take raising the tuition, we need to be bold enough to, to explain our, our our action and 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 take that bite. And, and do this. It's if, if we have to raise tuition by a dollar, I would much rather do that than say we're raising tuition with these fees by three hundred percent. Some of these fees are going up three and four hundred percent. That's not fair, right? And so we need to be bold enough to, to look at this. And maybe the fees are the right way. I'm not saying that they're not. Maybe they are the right way. 
But until we have a, a fair and honest way to look at this, we're not going to know, right? So here, I just did a quick comparison. I, I just, as, as to, I put my academic advisor hat on, and, and I'm sorry, I picked on whoever the first one was, that Chandler Gilbert? Uh, so you got an accounting fee, accounting uh, 112, $38. So you add, so that we're not charging $85 a credit hour anymore, we're charging $97.66 for that class per credit hour. So you have to add art to that, right? Art 100, because they need to, they need that humanities. We had a $10 fee to that, right? So now that class is $88.33 per credit hour. They have to take their science class, so they're gonna pick up geology, $20. All right, that makes our cla that class $91.66 uh, per credit hour. Oh, and they need math tutoring, so they're gonna take math 108, $25 a credit hour. That's math tutoring. That's money we should be getting from the state because the state hasn't done their job to prepare our students well enough to do college level math. So that's why we should be going to the legislature and asking for our, our money back to do the job that the state didn't do to, to begin with. Chancellor. Uh, Dr. Thor, I think we understand, excuse me, the charge and um, we will um, obviously follow uh, up accordingly. We've done exercises like this before. The 40, however many pages, used to be 300. And uh, we were able to move out all of the equipment that used to be actually charged uh, to the students. So now it's more consumables. But I think we understand what the concerns are and the questions. And we will work um, on beginning the work of the task force. Yes. Mrs. Sullivan. May I ask for an amendment to the amendment to put a date when this uh, report would be done so that there's full clarification? So it would be September of 2020. 2020. That this would be, is that, or is that what your understanding is, Chancellor, or do you have another recommendation date? Um, um, Mrs. Sullivan, members of the board, if we would like to implement a different structure for the fall of 2020, then the report needs to be done in the spring of 2020. Correct, but I, but I believe upon clarification, it wasn't necessary for the fall of 2020. It was consideration for the spring of 21. Of 21, correct. Then, um, 2020, the fall of 2020 would be appropriate because then that is part of the budget correct. cycle, and then the approval would be coming to the board about the same time that yeah, we're maybe October for, for the spring. 2020. Yes. So, so the task force would work would not have to be done prior to for a fall implementation, but instead for a spring 21. If that's what the board chooses, yes. Yes, I mean that was the clarification that I asked for earlier. No, uh, I hear a grimace. Is there a see a grimace? <laughs> Wait, maybe I need to amend that date. How about if you do the task force and come up with the date, knowing that the interest is not until spring of 21. We will do that. We'll propose a plan to the board. Thank you. Yes, so we are voting on the amendment, which includes approving this list of course B fees and special fee changes and adds the uh, request to the chancellor to form a task force to look at the whole Funding. structure for the spring of 2021. For possible implementation in the spring of 2021. Okay. Advisory vote? Yay. 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 <laughs> yes. 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 Board vote? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Nay. Nay. No. The Motion passes 4-3 with Mrs. McGrath, Mrs. Wynn, and Mr. Hendricks voting no. We're now at uh, non-consent items. 12.1 uh, South Mountain Community College level letter of intent regarding the sale of property at the northeast corner of South 40th Street and East Cottonwood Lane. Is there a motion? It's been, Second. it's been moved and seconded. Any questions or comments? Seeing none, advisory vote. Board vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? 
passes 7-0. We're now at information monitoring reports, 13.1, review of employment, regular short-term and specially funded and separations. Any comments or questions? Business services, 14.1, Review the budget analysis report for Fund 1. Any comments or questions? If not, we're at uh, governing uh, board reports. Mr. Hendricks? No report. Dr. Narini? <coughs> Let's see, I had an exciting month this month. Uh, start out at, at PC at the Founders Day. That was a wonderful celebration their 99th year. Uh, after that, uh, I spent some time with the Bilingual Nursing Program, uh, the Bilingual Nursing Fellowship over at, at South Mountain Community College. So Loida uh, Gutierrez invited me there to give a presentation on the students, uh, especially for the, the DACA students on different scholarships and different financial opportunities for them. Uh, later that evening, I went over to MCC to uh, to watch the documentary uh, screen of Here We Stand and the photo exhibition of the history of Chicanos por la Causa. Uh, Mecha from, from MCC invited, invited me there, offered uh, Chavez, because I was a former Mecha member at, at uh, MCC. And, but most exciting is last Friday, Megan McGuire invited me to be uh, part of the Frank Talks, um, where I got to introduce Scott Warner, or Scott Warner, Warren, I'm sorry, uh, from No More Deaths, um, who was, put on trial for having the audacity to help thirsty, hungry, injured people in the desert. Um, he was charged with a felony. Uh, so yes, yeah, so it was exciting. It was, it was um, a lot of fun. It was really interesting. And thank you all for inviting me to, to be part of that. Thank you, Mrs. Sullivan. I can't overlook the opportunity to congratulate Phoenix College on approaching its 100th year especially being an alum. So that was exciting. And with that, uh, for those of you in the audience, board members have opportunity for professional development. So I joined several of my colleagues in that. And what it inspired me to do is to always try to do a better job on your behalf. And I'm a constant lifelong learner in this. Thank you, Mrs. Wynn. I just want to take the opportunity to um, to acknowledge our chancellor. Um, during the last month, she uh, asked us not to renew her contract, and um, there's been a lot going on. This has been a busy nine months doing this job, but what it taught me and what it's teaching me is the most important thing is this community college system. And it isn't about one person, it isn't about one group. It's about what's in the best interest of our students. And the chancellor did that by making that decision. Um, she spent 28 years of her life contributing to this community college. And I'd like the last seven months that she's here to be the best seven months of her career. So I request that we, as a community college system, um, go out for her career and for the benefit of this college with our best efforts. Um, I know I'm planning on doing that and I'm asking that others join me in that effort. And um, um, there's gonna be some lagging indicators when you leave that will probably be increased enrollment and some amazing programs that we'll continue to share about. I think that she's leaving this college system better than she found it. And I, for one, am proud to serve on this board and um, I look forward to the efforts of FACT and all the changes that we're making. Um, it costs more to get an education these days as technology and things come. And hopefully we can keep our student costs low. That's one of our great advantages. But the most important thing we do is we help students become successful. And that's really our job. And all the other stuff is secondary. And um, I, for one, go to many meetings where the chancellor is acknowledged for her work and her many contributions. And so I hope the next seven months um, prove that we are the best community college besides being the largest community college system in the country. Thank you. Mrs. McGrath. No Mr. Sarr. None. Ms. Maya. 
So I went to a three-day leadership retreat where Maricopa Community College um, and other two districts were attended, and I was glad that I spoke to the students there about who I am, and I talked about the Student Senate, and I'm very happy that the Student Senate's coming along soon. And I also just want to comment on the uh, trustee retreat put on by the uh, Arizona uh, Community College Trustees, Arizona Association of Community College Trustees, AACCT, uh, and it exceeded my expectations. I thought it was a very, very good use uh, of our time, and I personally learned a lot and really appreciated the opportunity to interact uh, with board members from across the state. So I would like to thank Mr. Saar, who represents us on that group and participated in the planning for that. Our next meeting is October 22nd, 2019 at 6.30 p.m. That will be our regular board meeting. And we are adjourned. Got the <laughs> 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 <laughs>